Thank you so much to everyone for coming. Welcome. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Lorraine Working and I'm a postdoc on the TIDE project here at Oxford. TIDE is a five-year research project founded by the European Research Council and housed in the English faculty. And it explores transculturality, migration and identity in early modern England. And my specific of area of interest within the project is in English colonialism in the 16th and 17th centuries, and particularly how English concerns with um, and encounters with indigenous peoples influenced taste and politics in London at the time. So I'm really delighted to be here this evening with um, to talk about some of, of this work and also the work of my brilliant co-panelists. Um, so Dr. Lucy Powell and Dr. Stephanie Pratt, um, with thanks to the Being Human Festival for sponsoring and funding this event and, and the festival kind of runs through the next few weeks now. So I'll just introduce Lucy and Stephanie in the order that we're speaking. Um, and we'll be speaking around 15 minutes each and then followed up by conversation between us that, that picks up on some of these threads and issues that have come through our interconnected interests in tobacco and feathers in colonialism and material culture. So Dr. Lucy Powell is an ERC Leverhulme Fellow and JRF at Trinity College um, here. She gained her PhD from UCL from which her first monograph, British Prison Fictions, 1718 to 1780, emerged. Her new project, The Feathered Tribe, looks at the way in which birds and feathered objects enabled Britain to stage itself as newly, a newly global trading power in the 18th century. So Lucy is a BBC New Generation thinker and has made programs across the network on silence, dreams, and sibling relationships, among others. And I've had the privilege to know Stephanie Pratt for some years now through my PhD research, and it's a great pleasure to have her here with us this evening. Stephanie, formerly Associate Professor in Art History at Plymouth University, and now an independent scholar and curator, is the first cultural ambassador for her her tribal council at the Crow Creek Dakota Indian Reservation in South Dakota. She is a consultant to Exeter City Council's cultural program and has been outspoken in the press against the use by Exeter Rugby Club of their derogatory Native American inspired mascot. Uh, she's a member of the Kunsi Unchi Grandmothers Society founded at Fort Thompson, South Dakota, which promotes the understanding and preservation of Dakota Nakoda and Lakota culture and language. Stephanie's book, American Indians in British Art, 1700 to 1840, was the first study of its kind, and she's explored many of its central themes in her other publications over the last 30 years. In my portion of the talk, I want to explore how tobacco, a plant cultivated by indigenous peoples in the Americas for millennia, began to appear in the playhouses and poems of Shakespeare's London. What can its presence in English society tell us about the art of looking and imperial ecologies? So to place tobacco in context, um, part of the reason we wanted to have this event um, now is that this, is, this year is the 400th anniversary of the establishment of the Oxford Botanic Garden in 1621, the oldest of its kind in England. By the 1650s, the garden contained tobacco and sunflowers from the Americas, as well as Persea americana, avocado, and vanilla plantifolia, the orchid that produces vanilla. These plants would have been familiar to 16th and 17th century readers of texts that describe how the Mexica prepared and flavored chocolate, for example. Such plants appeared in English colonial treatises and herbaria and other botanical and medical books, but also perhaps in, in less expected areas, such as watercolors or even embroideries on women's clothing. So Lucy, Stephanie and I were lucky enough to visit the Oxford Herbaria recently to examine some of the plants that crossed the Atlantic and entered into Oxford collections in the mid 17th century. And you might be able to recognize tobacco, pressed tobacco here in these pages. Um, so we had a look at these tobacco plants. We also looked at maize, at sunflowers. Um, one of my favorites as well, this, um, these pressed strawberries of Virginia leaves. 
So beautifully pressed and preserved specimens that continue to inform scientific knowledge um, for um, scientists today and also testify to the fascination with cataloging and collecting in the early modern period. Um, but for me, at times, the history of collecting and knowledge gathering can seem a bit static, as if things sat behind panes of glass or in the pages of books, divorced from cultural, political or social contexts. So a lot of my work is concerned with the, the sociability, art and literature that formed in English society around things from America, um, and about thinking about how we can connect these to their places of origins and to their appropriations and translations in other contexts. So I think of this as, as creative refractions, um, whereby English writers and artists built real and imagined worlds around goods that were unfamiliar to them. Um, and one little example here, a Charles I court painter, Anthony Van Dyke, with some of those plants that we saw in the herbaria earlier, um, the sunflower from the Americas, that he specifically used as a symbol of, of the sun and of royalty, particularly that of the Stuart court. So it's just one small example of how a plant that might seem quite domestic is actually the product of these flows of um, exploration and, and exploitation. But back to tobacco. So here is an image of tobacco as it appeared in a medical book by a Spanish physician, um, but published in English in 1577 as joyful news out of the newfound world. And the English in the late 16th and early 17th centuries were, of course, establishing trade routes with many other parts of the globe. But unlike trade in, say, the Ottoman Empire, English intervention in the Americas involved settler colonialism. So tobacco is particularly significant because it offers us a way of engaging directly with indigenous knowledge and belief systems, while simultaneously offering us insights into the development of English territorial expansion and plantation. Although it was grown in England, James I banned tobacco growing in 1619 in order to give fledgling English colonies in Bermuda and in, Vir in Virginia a chance to develop what was already becoming their most lucrative export. So wherever there's a young, fashionable London gentleman in the early 17th century, tobacco isn't far behind. His recreations are his only studies, mocked one satirist, as plays, dancing, taverns, and tobacco. Um, and you get a sense of the scale of this when you see just how many extant pipes survive from the early 17th century. So this is a very, very small sample um, from the tobacco pipe archive at the University of Liverpool, for example. Um, and we also see this humorously depicted in um, a woodcut in Anthony Shute's 1595 Tobacco, where tobacco pipes, you can see in that middle image, are brought into the gentry aesthetic of heraldic devices and shields, crowns, laurel leaves, and swords. Um, and this kind of Raleigh-esque figure who's, who's smoking the pipe. Um, and also the tobacco boxes from the early 17th century um, those used by the elite, often used in, um, made from gold or silver, and they're not stamped with indigenous iconographies on them, they're actually stamped with heraldic devices. Um, so I, I, I want to take this a bit further, so not just tracing tobacco in England, but also thinking about its connection to colonial encounters and thinking about how much consumers were aware of these dynamics. In 1599, a Swiss visitor to London was dismayed that the English are constantly smoking tobacco. The habit is so common with them that they always carry the instruments on them and light up on all occasions, at the play, in the taverns. The herb is imported from the Indies in great quantities and some types are much stronger than the others, which difference they can immediately taste. And they first learned of this from the Indians. So I find this observation really interesting because it explicitly connects smoking to the Indies and to indigenous knowledge. They learn smoking from the Indians. This knowledge, however, is exploitative and often a praise of intoxication hinges on references to the geopolitics of plantation. And I have just a few examples from um, some poems of the time to illustrate this. So in 1602, John Beaumont, um, who, who was the brother of the better known Francis Beaumont, the playwright, wrote A Metamorphosis of Tobacco, a lengthy poem that reveres tobacco as a divine gift. Me let the sound of great tobacco praise, the cornucopia of all earthly pleasure, 
a worthy plant springing from Flora's hand, the blessed offspring of an uncouth land. So here tobacco is seen as a reward for English expansion. The English could now rule over Virginia and the newfound land and spread the colors of our English rose in the far countries where tobacco grows. Um, and we get, we then get Raphael Thorius's Hymnus Tabaci, or um, kind of hymn or song of tobacco, written in the 1610s. Thorius presents tobacco as a native plant of the Americas, but one that belongs in the hands of Europeans. In its ludicrous scenario, Bacchus, um, god of wine and general debauchery, conducts a war against Native Americans to claim tobacco for himself and his legion of merrymakers. Um, and so this very much, this poem very much echoes Odysseus's journey um, in the Odyssey, where Bacchus finds himself in a cannibal cave, and he tells the man-eater he encounters that he has up until now but played the man. Only by knowing how to drink and smoke, not alone but in sociable company, would he instill the arts into gross minds. So the poem presents wine and tobacco as a civilizing force that contains the power to transform the indigenous peoples of America into um, what this character of Bacchus sees as a refined being. So the poem presents ideal sociability as one that's articulated through quite an aggressive Protestant masculinity. It advances a model of Atlantic intervention that supposedly benefits the people whom the English are dispossessing. Banish my friends these unclean rites, Bacchus's followers tell the cave dwellers, and live the life of men. Here your recovery lies, only be willing to be cured. So there's a very conscious sense in which gentlemen in England are developing a literary sociability that's built on this new practice and which served to foster a connection between England and colonial spaces. At the same time, the indigenous knowledge that the English rely on to successfully cultivate the plant is often downplayed. And I just want to end with a few examples of how we see this. Um, so this weird little brain-like object um, from Jamestown is the oldest tobacco seed that archaeologists have found on the English colonial site. And it's an amazing find because it's, it, it's really, really small. It takes about 350,000 of these to weigh one ounce. So it really is just kind of a, a little pinprick. So when they arrived in North America, the English found the Nicotiana rustica, the leaf smoked by Eastern North Americans to be more bitter than the Spanish types they were accustomed to smoking in Central and South America. And the English planter John Rolfe is credited with having brought the North American seeds together with the strains grown in South America. And it might be that he obtained these seeds um, while shipwrecked um, on Bermuda shortly before traveling to Jamestown in 1610. And that shipwreck is um, what may have inspired William Shakespeare's The Tempest. But Rolf's knowledge of tobacco did not just come from observing plants or cultivating seeds. Here, his marriage to the Algonquin woman Pocahontas is significant. According to the oral history of the Mataponi, one of the original six indigenous groups who were in the Chesapeake during the time of English colonization, it was the Powhatans who taught English colonists to cultivate tobacco. Um, and the oral history specifically states, um, and I'm quoting here, it is significant that the marriage was between an English commoner, a tobacco planter, and a member of the Powhatan royal family. The Powhatan Cuyacros, or spiritual leaders, became friendlier to the settlers as a result of the marriage. The leaders among the English colonists wanted to gain more information on how priests process tobacco. After his marriage to Pocahontas, Rolf sought counsel from the Powhatan on curing his tobacco crop, end quote. So in other words, one of the most famed and celebrated Anglo-Indigenous marriages, that of John Rolfe and Pocahontas, may have occurred so that the English could gain secret Indigenous knowledge about a plant that they wanted to turn into a lucrative colonial export. So although the marriage is celebrated as a happy union that would bring two societies together, it's very clear that the assimilation is only ever really intended to go one way. And we see this in the archaeology of some of the early plantations. And I, I won't go into too much detail on this because apparently some people don't care about tobacco pipe shapes as much as I do. Mm -hmm. um, but the white clay pipes, um, as, as you see kind of there on the top left, um, comprise an overwhelming majority of the pipes in the settlements. And you see another little snapshot of those on the side um, image there. Whereas Algonquin pipes were made of local terracotta, such as the one on the bottom left, 
um, in, in that um, elbow shape, more of an elbow shape. Um, and English pipes are manufactured in large part from the, the white Dorset clay brought to London to supply the monopoly held by the tobacco pipe makers of London and Westminster. So only 3.9% of the pipes excavated at the sand site, for example, where, where this image is, is taken from, were indigenous. So the English are occupying native soil and learning how to smoke based on the practices of Native Americans, but they're going out of their way to smoke the pipes that have been made by artisans 3,000 miles away. And when they did experiment with terracotta and more recognizably Algonquin forms, as um, Robert Cotton did in 1608, they're stamped with the names of investors of the Virginia Company and other supporters back home. So you can kind of see on these pipes, um, you might just be able to make out the, the E of Southampton, so the Earl of Southampton, Shakespeare's patron. And also on the bottom there, the S and the R, the Sir Walter, um, so Walter Raleigh. So to return to the art of looking, when we see an image like this of a 17th century still life with its tobacco pipes, we're seeing a seemingly neutral thing, a cluster of pipes in a painting about global goods. But we're already viewing something through th this image through a colonized lens. The tobacco appears to us as a result of a complex process of appropriation, recontextualization, and the sharing and erasure of indigenous knowledge. There's a whole world of, rela of relations of labor, economy, and taste that lies behind it. We see a plant native to the Americas removed from its indigenous associations in things like those little um, tobacco boxes that you can see on the table. The pipes themselves look different. They're made from that white European clay. Um, their stems are much longer, partly to control the heat, but also I think to facilitate that kind of sociability that we encountered in those tobacco poems, which urged readers to embrace the arts of intoxication and sociability. Um, and so to go back to renewal, which is the theme of the Being Human Festival, I wanted to end with the words of the indigenous writer and botanist Robin Wall Kimmerer, who wrote that since 1492, the land shows the bruises of an abusive relationship. It's not just land that is broken, but most importantly, our relationship to the land. Breathe in its scent and you start to remember things you didn't know you'd forgotten. And so one of the hopes I think of our conversation this evening is, is to try to, to, to engage in that act of recovery, to think about these relationships differently. Okay, so I'm gonna follow um, in the wake of another plume as it travels along with tobacco smoke across the Atlantic, forging and refiguring identities as it goes, the feather. So we think we know where we are when it comes to feathers and the Americas. They are, after all, one of the most immediately, instantly recognizable signifiers of Native American peoples in Western print media in the form of a feathered headdress. So here being appropriated wholesale and without any apology to augment the sale of tobacco, we see the outline of a Native American man along with a slew of pervasive and pernicious inferences about unreconstructed masculinity, the natural order and earthy courage that so often are made to attend on that. And it's the feather headdress that is performing this work without us even really having to think about it or process it. And this association between feathers and the Americas has an extraordinarily long life, in fact. So from the moment he set foot in the Americas in 1519, the conquistador Hunan Cortes decided to use feather work consciously as a way of proving the existence and also demonstrating the profusion, the plenty um, of the so-called new world. So in the National Museum in Nuremberg, there are these 11 depictions of Aztec Indians who were brought as booty by Cortes to the court of Charles V. These images were drawn from life in 1529 in Toledo or Barcelona by Christoph Feiditz, who was a visiting artist from Augsburg. It's actually part of a costume book in which the costumes and habits and dress of various countries are elucidated, including, for instance, the Italian. Um, <clears throat> Now, we know next to nothing about the human subjects of these images, but what we do know is that no birds that are native to Europe sport plumage anywhere near as brightly coloured as this. 
Moreover, no European craft workers had anything like the skills necessary to construct featherwork as intricate and elaborate as this. These feathers instantiate, then, the natural and um, cultural wealth of the Americas. But if the association of featherwork with Native American culture has proved astonishingly durable, the meanings that they carried as they made their way with increasing frequency across the Atlantic are anything but stable. Feathers are a persistently slippery signifier, and it's this that I want to explore today, their mirroring quality, both in terms of augmenting a sense of self and also of flipping, of inverting it. So I want to demonstrate this idea by looking at this portrait by Titian of a young woman painted some seven years later in 1536 in Italy. It's an immediately immensely sensual image. The fur lining of the coat, the drooping plumes of the feathers in her hat bespeak a softness, an intimate animality that we're invited to imagine echoed in her skin. She holds the coat so that it covers her nakedness, but her grasp on it is tentative. It could at any moment fall and expose her to the viewer. But the feathers convey a now elusive subtext, because until the late 17th century in Europe, feathers were a masculine accessory. Related to the great billowing ostrich feathers um, that once adorned the helmets of medieval jousting knights, by the 16th century they graced the hats of soldiers and merchants and troubadour poets and musicians, but they still bore these inferences of martial valour and masculine virility as well as registers of self-restraint and courtesy. And what this means is that to a 16th century observer, this young woman in a state of dishevelled undress is wearing a man's clothes. She displays, in other words, the fact that a man who is in very close proximity to her is not wearing his clothes. So from femininity, bashfulness and softness then, the feather's meaning flips. They instead imbue the image with dramatic sexual dynamism and cross-dressing play. Now, this mesitant by William Vincent in London in the 1690s is both a register of and a reason why feathers were fast becoming the height of feminine fashion in Europe, a gender trend that would not reach its peak until the late 19th century. It's a portrait of Anne Bracegirdle, a very famous actress on the Restoration stage. She's playing the part, we're told, of the Indian Queen, which refers either to the title role in the play of that name by John Dryden and Robert Howard from 1664, which tells the story of Montezuma's ascent to power in Mexico just before the Spanish invasion, or it may refer to the role of Smyrna, a Native American queen in the colony of Virginia, who falls in love with the white colonist Nathaniel Bacon in The Widow Ranter, which is a play by Afra Ben, performed in 1689. Both women, in case you wanted to know, die um, bereft of their power and their love. In both cases, it is the feathers which enable the white European actress to perform the part to assume the identity of a Native American on stage. Everything else about her appearance is entirely European. Her feathers, however, are clearly non-native to England. They add to her physical stature and augment or exaggerate the grace of her movements across the stage, and they are rare and therefore expensive enough to connote royal status. And although this is always described as a portrait of Anne Bracegirdle, it is also, clearly, a portrait of two other people who are integral to her staging as a queen, her unnamed and still unknown attendants, seemingly of African origin. One carries her train, the other holds a plumed parasol over her head, shading her pale skin from the sun. These figures are clearly differentiated by gender, by stature and by skin colour, and also by the gulf in social status that these last two things imply. But the attendants too sport feathers, which is also the only thing identifying them as performing Native Americanness. On Brace Girdle, the white woman, the feathers denote cosmopolitanism, wealth, femininity and fashion. On the attendants, they denote something quite different. We might almost say the opposite of these things. They speak to the inverse of the urbane, cosmopolitan and feminine. Yet the feathers in Bracegirdle's hand, which form her fan, which are probably parrot feathers, 
are the very same material objects that adorn her attendant's headbands. The drooping feathers held aloft by her closest attendant are the same that she sports in her headdress. <clears throat> in other words, there is a strange and contested degree of congruity or kinship which the feathers assert across geographic spaces and subject positions. None of the people in this image are quite what they seem, and their shape-shifting is enabled in each case by the feathers that they wear, the garb of another species altogether. In the process, the embodied presence of actual Native American peoples and the violence shadowing the bird's initial loss of their feathers and the indigenous people's secondary loss of their feather work is effaced. Mimicry, as Omi Bawa put it, is at once resemblance and menace. Standing in for someone else demonstrates the ease with which they can be erased. Now, this is neither the beginning nor, curiously, the end of these feathers' journey across geographic and hermeneutic spaces spanning the Atlantic. We first hear of it in Orinoco by Afra Ben, published in 1688, two years before the Bracegirdle Mesitant. Orinoco is the story of a royal African tricked into slavery by a perfidious Christian. He's abducted to the short-lived colony of Suriname, English colony that is, it became a Dutch colony soon after this was published, a northeast corner of South America, where he's reunited with his wife in Moinda and also enslaved and pregnant with their child. Partly to prevent this child being born into slavery, Orinoco leads an uprising which fails before killing the willing Imawinda and being taken, tied to a stake and brutally tortured. Famously, he smokes a pipe of tobacco while he's being dismembered. Ben's narrator claims to have had this story straight from its actor's mouths. It is, her title page proclaims, truth and history rather than romance and fantasy. At the very beginning of her tale, Ben elaborates the glories of the colony of Suriname for her English readers. She establishes an uneasy distinction between the pirated African populations who work the plantations as slaves and the native Arawak peoples of Suriname, with whom she says, we live in perfect amity, before explaining that their knowledge of the country was crucial for early colonists' survival. She adds, we trade for feathers, which they order into all shapes, make themselves little short habits of them and glorious wreaths for their necks, heads, arms and legs, whose tinctures are unconceivable. I had a set of these presented to me and gave them to the King's Theatre and it was the dress of the Indian Queen, infinitely admired by persons of quality and it was unimitable. Now, unlikely as it sounds, we now think that in all probability Afra Ben did visit the colony of Suriname in the early 1660s, for anywhere between two months and four years. Whether she was in fact presented with a fe feather headdress there, and whether this specific object is in actuality the very same that is depicted in the mezzotint of Anne Bracegirdle playing the Indian Queen, is an intensely fascinating question, which is also, in some important senses, completely beside the point. Because such feathers were brought to London, as we've seen, they could not have originated in Europe, a continent lacking both the natural materials and the craft skills requisite to create them. And they were then deployed to perform Native American identities on stage. We trade for feathers, Ben writes, which they order into all shapes, whose tinctures are inconceivable. And these things are demonstrably true. So Ben is able to use the material fact of a feather headdress in London as an authenticating device for her prose fictions of the new world. Later in the novel, Ben meets the inhabitants of a Native American village. They are all naked, she writes, and we were dressed, so as is most commode for the hot countries, very glittering and rich, so that we appeared extremely fine. My own hair was cut short and I had a taffety cap with black feathers on my head. She reports that the villagers doubted her humanness and examined her inch by inch as an alien curiosity. She's then introduced to the chiefs of this community, who she describes with a bow at their back and a quiver of arrows on their thighs, and most had feathers on their heads of diverse colours. Again, feathers signal the great cultural differences between the actors in this scene, but they also underscore an incomplete and contested kind of kinship since each of them is adorned with the costume, if you like, of a bird, 
Feathers underscore this scene in less visible ways too. The European, with ink-black feathers in her hair, is using the feather of a bird as a quill, with which to inscribe her transatlantic tales of slavery and insurrection. And the indigenous peoples she describes there use feathers to fletch the arrows that swell their quivers, a disquieting signal of the armed contest over the territory that Ben is bodying forth. And this mirroring effect, in which feathers enable an elaboration of cultural difference while also subtly refusing it, recurred in the most extraordinary way in the following decade in London. And it's here that I want to end my talk today. So these imposing oil portraits were commissioned by Queen Anne and they hung in the English court for over a hundred years. They were given to the Canadian people in 1977 by Queen Elizabeth II. They depict four Native American leaders who sailed from North America to London in April of 1710. Accompanied by colonial sponsors and translators, these men constituted an embassy. Known as the Indian Kings, they were in reality three sovereigns of the Iroquois Confederacy and an Algonquin Mohican. And their visit was part of a mission to forge alliances with native forces against French settlers in North America and to secure support for this military endeavour in London. And in both of these, their visit was a resounding success. Now, on the 13th of March, 1710, while the Iroquois were en route to London, the Queen's Theatre revived John Dryden's play, The Indian Emperor, or The Conquest of Mexico, by the Spaniards. This is the sequel to The Indian Queen. And she returns in this later play as a ghost, still in her exotic feathers. She now boasts a dagger in her breast with which she berates her faithless lover, Montezuma. On April the 21st, 1710, the Iroquois had arrived in London and were housed in lodgings in Covent Garden. The Theatre Royal, Drury Lane, revived Thomas Southern's stage adaptation of Afra Ben's novel, Orinoco, or The Royal Slave. The Indian kings could have walked to the show in under 15 minutes. The duration, publicity and visibility of the Iroquois embassy was unprecedented. And much has been made of the fact that every last detail of their visit, which included a cockfight, an opera, a play and appearances at court, was both a public spectacle and a carefully orchestrated act of diplomacy. The men performed their roles theatrically. Indeed, we have evidence that they were in fact readied for public appearance by a London theatre's costumier. The 18th century historian Joel John Oldmixon writes in 1735 that the Queen was advised to make much of them. They were called kings, he adds, and were clothed by the playhouse tailor like other kings of the theatre. In particular, he mentions these gilt-edged red cloaks that feature here in the Verslet oil port port portraits. Sorry. If this is true, and Old Mixon asserts it twice, it raises two mind-boggling possibilities. The first is that these men were dressed in the props and costumes of a concocted kingship foisted on them by a British administration in international turmoil at exactly the same time and by the very same costume department, that of the Queen's Theatre, that was dressing white European actresses like Anne Bracegirdle as Indian queens. They may have stood there in the ill-lit, damp dressing rooms of a London playhouse in the chill of April 1710 and recognised the inimitable colours and forms of featherwork that could only have hailed from home. I wonder what they would have made of it, this potent symbol of place and power, traduced and emptied of its first meanings and performing instead the erasure of its origin. And the second is whether those white egret feathers which tuffed out from behind the ears of each of the leaders portrayed here, were also loaned them from the theatre department. These genuine pieces of Americana, which in some ways pierce through the pretense of the Europeanized display of kingship, to whom did they belong? Do these feathers elaborate or break through their costumes? Are they another hall of mirrors on loan from the basket marked Indian royalty in the Queen's Theatre London? What did the Iroquois see when they witnessed themselves remade in these gilt-edged, carefully feathered European modes? It is in search of these answers, elusive and elided as they are, that scholarship must now go. Thank you. <laughs>
I want to pick up on both of these topics and look at the indigenous perspectives on pipe smoking, feathers, and other material exchanges. First of all, I, I have an understanding of feathers from my indigenous background, and I guess I could just say they are a very potent and multi-layered uh, piece of the natural world. And I've been told by many of the elders, don't ever pick up a feather. And I think what that means is that the feather is an obligation. And from what I know of indigenous culture, it is a set of relationships with all things, with all other than human beings, and feathers and birds are part of that, the, the winged ones. So um, I'd like to look at feathers um, from the perspective of the English visitors, explorers that Lorraine mentioned, and to think about how different species of birds are generally seen as forms of communication, both by the indigenous person, but also by the observers, the English, who are there. So feathers from certain species evoke different qualities, and particularly, say, the gift of an eagle feather is very, very significant. The eagle is one of the highest flying birds, so when you're gifted an eagle feather, it's one of the greatest honors you can ever achieve as an indigenous person. It's the highest honor in Dakota, Lakota culture. So these early English images, which you see of indigenous Americans from the 1580s, depict the uses of birds and bird feathers as important items of power and communication. So you see, um, looking at the figure on the left, Thomas Harriet, who was the science officer on the Roanoke colonizing venture of 1585 to the land they called Virginia. Um, and in his A Brief and True Report of 1588, he talks about what he sees as spiritual practitioners of magic and conjuring, which he termed the flyer. And you can see on the drawing by John White, it says the flyer, but also referred to as a conjurer or juggler and whose placement of the bird on the side of his head was seen as a, quote, badge of their office and helped in their efforts to achieve a trance or state of spirit possession. And some of this language of juggling and magic and conjuring is, is an attempt to understand what is a very mysterious ceremonial activity that's going on between the person you see depicted and his communication, which the English were trying to figure out maybe. So John White, the artist of the image on the left, who also later became the governor of the Roanoke colony, constructed his ad indigenous medicine leader to illustrate Harriet's account. And he figures him as an Algonquin Mercury, a messenger between earth and the other world gods. And if you think about it, the Roman god Mercury was a close approximate in White's conception in that he is the god of, among other things, eloquence, messages, communication, including divination, travelers, boundaries, luck, trickery, and thieves. So you have this sense of the English coming to terms through using their own historical and classical referencing. You know, what is this person we're looking at? We want to understand. I'm the science officer, and here is the artist. So they're making these approximations. And also, interestingly, Mercury is also a guide of souls to the underworld. So there is this idea of a transcendence, a communication between other realms and other spiritual realms. So that's I find that really interesting. And so we have another example on the right of a Tupinamba ceremonial dance observed both by Hans Staden, a German sailor military man held captive in eastern Brazil in 1552-3, and then also by Jean de Lery, a Protestant ministry, a missionary, who in 1558 also was amongst the Tupinamba. Uh, 
But what's interesting in debris, and this is the image you see on, on the right in, in the German text, that he's conflated Hans Staden's experiences and Jean Delary to create a sort of, if you like, a composite image, that's, um, some rationalization of what actually took place. If you read Delary's published account, he describes, quote, certain men called pagics who are esteemed as soothsayers. They paint themselves black and decorate themselves with gaily mixed red and white plumes. Sometimes they feather their entire bodies. His commentary also emphasizes a transcendence of the ordinary through birds' feathers used as adornment. So I think it's, it's interesting to look at Debris because he was such an influential publisher. His works were published in, in several languages, Latin, German, English, and French. So they, they basically permeated Europe. And what these engravings tend to do is to create, well, you start with the elevated viewpoint. Here is a person who's not involved in the scene, looking down, making sense of giving you a rational explanation of a ceremonial dance in what in reality was would have been very difficult to see maybe, you would have seen people moving, maybe doing mysterious things. And one of the things we still don't know is if they are blowing tobacco out of those pipes that you see. And that's something that I've, I'm still researching, but I think it probably is tobacco because tobacco is such an important, important thing for native people. Okay, so I want to turn to tobacco. Harriet was one of the first Englishmen to see tobacco being grown, and he described it being used to purge obstructions, but also that it was used to communicate with metaphysical beings. Hence, quote, if they are in a storm upon the waters to pacify their gods, they cast some up into the air and into the water. Tobacco was, quote, of so precious estimation amongst them that they think their gods are marvelously delighted therewith. And I, I love that because actually we do think that. <laughs> I, I think tobacco was the great healer, the great communicator, the plant that we used. Um, I'm speaking, you know, as someone, my ancestry, <laughs> but I still use it to communicate with the water. And when we think about water today and we as an indigenous people become water protectors, we use the tobacco to, to heal with the water because the water itself is this being. It's this marvelous thing that we as indigenous people really understand or try to understand with our own science and our own knowledge and understanding. So tobacco was used in at least four ways by many Native American nations. Number one, for prayers, for offerings and ceremonies. So, you know, we saw several ceremonies. You see here another debris image where it's a whole set of curative practices and in the back there's a tobacco pipe being smoked. But also they use it as medicine to cure, as gifts to visitors and as ordinary smoking tobacco. So it has this kind of multi value, multi-use. The variety tradition used was as Lorena's Nicotiana Rustica. And early examples of North American tobacco pipes include highly polished stone cylinders, while later examples show a separate bowl and stem. The human or animal faces that adorn these pipes are often shown facing directly into the smoker's eyes as if to directly communicate between tobacco and the smoker. There's something going on in that practice. It isn't simply smoking or maybe getting the intoxication. There's, and, and this is true that when you pray and you pray with tobacco, you, you use it in that sense. So um, moving from the, a drawn image to one engraved and placed in a frame, print surrounded by textual explanation. It helps to convince readers and viewers that they were hearing and seeing factual information about indigenous people. And I can't emphasize enough how much debris images were used and reused in books, in prints, in um, cabinets. I mean, everywhere you go, you see these same images repeated. And so what I want to sort of finish on is um, looking at allegory. And I think that the allegory of, 
the continent of America is what I see underpinning a lot of what's been said, is that the conceptual nature of this kind of an image where you take a complex place like America or the Americas and you condense it to a set of distinct symbolic elements. America was a crowned, a feather crowned man or woman, usually called a, a queen or a prince, and they were seen as the embodiment of the, of the continent. And so you see on the right, the um, Gottfried Mace um, with the parrot feathers, uh, the, the alligator, but underneath, and this is something that's very rare in allegory to see a smoking on the right hand side, um, smoking, but with a European, looking like a European pipe, um, the little putti underneath. But also in, on the one on the left, um, you know, this really triumphal figure that's, you know, throwing the goods and the, and the riches through a cornucopia. Um, and lots and lots of different kinds of feathers. And if you see one of the men at the bottom on the left, he's got a little bird's head figure on top. These early allegory images started what I call a visual maneuver, which collapsed unfamiliar and complex interactions into images of single figures or groups and often emphasized extreme behavior nakedness, um, ferocity, often cannibalism can be shown in this. The allegory of American is, as an image was not stable though, and it could transform as new information about indigenous Americans and their useful products became available. So for me, this um, one on the left, uh, sorry, yeah, your left, Jacob van Meers, um, his illustration to the new and unknown world or description of America of um, 1671, just seems to capture all of that sense of this richness and complexity. You see lots of different animals, like alpaca and llama. Um, but also what's interesting is the context of the European, that inside the allegory suddenly we're placing it on a, on a quayside with European ships coming and a fort in the background. So there's a sense of, you know, yes, we, there's a wonderful place, but it's being contained. And they talk about this whole set of books that Van Meers started publishing as a new form of European engagement with a non-European world. He hit upon a printerly formula for presenting the world, large, lavish, visually ornate books, geographical compendia that span the globe. These collections approximated in their construction a printed form of the Wunderkammer. They spoke, or they bore titles that commonly played on the spatial analogy, the great cabinet of curiosities, the wonder-filled world, or more prosaically, more commercially candid, the warehouse of wonders. In a sense, Dutch bookmakers in this way commodified exotic geography. And, and when I say that, I mean that it was palatable. It, it was easily um, managed. You know, we can, we, can, we can package this and we can sell it and we can make money. So um, in my last slide, I wanna talk about collecting and commodification because uh, some of what Lucy and some of what Lauren said is this idea of, well, appropriation and, you know, repackaging for other um, societies and in other values. So indigenous featherwork had always been valued the Mexican featherwork, and in also the Tupinamba fe featherwork. And so it was collected into cabinets, just like I mentioned, these cabinets. And in 2019, they restored the feathered um, ceremonial, this very rare ceremonial cloak. They, they beautifully restored it. Um, and it is still in Milan, in the Museo Ambrosiana. But it was collected and displayed by Manfredo Satala, who was a, a learned naturalist and, and, and we would consider a scientist. And he had his cabinet. You can see on the right, far right of the cabinet is the displayed cloak. And I'm just, I'm so taken with this, how they beautifully restored this and they're not going to give it back. You know, it's, this is for, this is for us, <laughs> you know. So clearly a well-valued treasure of long standing, you know, value in a European collection and speaking just to me so eloquently of why there's such an inequality in the relationships. Um, 
uh, and it's so much a misunderstanding. And if you look on the cloak, you can see picked out in blue and, and yellow the figure of what they think is a bird character. So again, that really deep sense, the way feathers can configure meaning in such a huge way, which we just don't see in Europe. So I just want to question, throw it out there, what happens when an item or a piece of material culture changes from a kind of use value, if you like a Marxist use value, to an exchange value in Marxian terms, when it becomes commodified? And I just want you to think another clear example of this would be in what happened in the fur trade in the 17th century and how devastating that was to indigenous culture and they've never really got over that impact in the 17th century. So thank you for listening. <laughs> I had a question. Okay. <laughs> Which was why was the what happened in the 17th century in the fur trade devastating to I don't know the story. Can you? <laughs> okay. Just, I mean, I did have, I should have brought slides. Basically, there was a fashion for beaver felt hats mm -hmm. in the 17th century from the Thirty Years War and these beautiful draping hats yeah. that cavaliers would yeah. wear. And then also, of course, in the Restoration, people wanted that look. It was very elegant. You could take the hat off and kind of, and they really could only be made from beaver because beaver fur is so beautifully resilient and it's waterproof and it felt so well. So the Russians were expert at this and then they ran out, the Europeans started running out of beaver. And just at that time, they, they had sort of started to think, well, well let's go hunt, hunt it in North America. And the Hudson Bay Company was formed in 1670, but there was trapping before that. But really, the biggest, the biggest impact was in bringing guns over and giving them to the indigenous people who then started fighting each other over the fur. So the beaver was nearly hunted to extinction in, in um, my, my, peop, my ancestors' culture. But the thing about the beaver is it's not just its wonderful fur. It actually is such an ecologist itself, and we know this now from contemporary rewilding, is that beaver is the trigger for spring. It was like part of the calendar. And when you hunt it out, you don't, you don't know what to do anymore. You, you, you don't know when the right time is to plant. You don't know when the right time that the spring melt is happening. The beavers told you that. You honor those beavers for what they tell you, not what you do to them. And, and I think that's that whole relationship you mentioned that Robin Wall Kimmerer was talking about, that we, we need to find that balance again to get back to that. But that's why I mentioned the fur trade. <laughs> it's such a good example, I think, of because it's such an iconographic image from so many portraits of the Elizabethan and Jacobean mm -hmm. era, for example, all those miniatures, um, and as you say, the Cavaliers, even I think even John Donne's portrait at the National Portrait <laughs> Gallery, um, that must be a, a beaver felt hat that he's, you know, he's got this big white, and it's often, and Nicholas Hilliard paints so much of them as well, where you have the beaver hat and then the gentlemen kind of Cavaliers styling themselves with these melancholy gentlemen with their arms crossed and they're writing these poems about, yeah you know, the spices of and of the, the Indies and the minds of the Indies. And there's this whole connection there between the ecology and the kind of commodity consumption and the self-fashioning of gentlemen. And it just makes us think so differently about this, these ideas of early modern self-fashioning that we have in these in so many of these images. Yeah, because the rarity value and, and, and really beaver was always going to be fairly rare. I, I know they did flood the market in the 17th century, but even into the 19th century, they were still hunting it. And, pe and really, you know, um, you see, uh, there's a portrait in Bristol, this 19th century portrait. I was going to bring it along. This nice gentleman with the beaver hat mm -hmm. and contrast it with my ancestor who mm -hmm. wasn't able to... to use fur anymore and he has a blanket he's using a blanket to adorn himself so it's that whole kind of it's almost like you know they they realize the value but not the connection or something i, I wondered about just i know I, i'm sure everyone's got millions of questions for you but one, one question i had for you and then i'll leave you alone with them is is what the contemporary relationship between native peoples or 
for instance, your people is with tobacco because there is a huge kind of, you know, global health push to forget the tobacco relationship. And I wondered how that is playing out in a contemporary. Well, just briefly, you know, we do use the modern forms of it, although they really increase the strength by yeah. John Rolfe. Didn't he find some tobacco in Brazil or somewhere or Bermuda, was it? And mm-hmm. brought it in so that it's a much stronger ver- variety now, isn't it? And yeah. I think it's it's meant to be. I I don't remember the exact number. It's something like six times stronger than mm-hmm. than what we're accustomed to. And also so. with additional nicotine, I think to make it's, it more addictive. Yeah, I I I will personally say that I use it because it is the form of communication. Mm-hmm. But I don't feel I have to burn it to use it. Okay. And also we do things like feed things Mm -hmm. so we will feed like have a drum i made and so i'll rub the tobacco to feed it and it's just a thing that one does um a ritual Mm -hmm. and yeah we use tobacco modern Mm -hmm. tobacco okay but that distinction between smoking tobacco and other you know other properties of the plant itself is is there in the early modern period as well there is a recognition that okay that the sociability or anti kind of civility sometimes as detractors would say of smoking is its is its own thing and that mm-hmm. there's so many other ways to use it to put it in kind of herbal teas or things like mm-hmm. that in, in the household um i don't lucy have you i was just curious about this but yeah. have you seen any have you been looking at examples of a feather work have you had the chance to do that yet or no. not because no. Just, just <laughs> hearing representations thereof. Yeah, because I'm just thinking because the because the Pitt Rivers Museum mm-hmm. here in Oxford has yes. so so much feather work, including mm-hmm. some from the early modern period and much later. And building on what Steph was saying with the beavers, but to me, when I had the chance to go and look at some of it, it it begins to seem like you're in a kind of graveyard or like you're surrounded by kind of death in the archives rather mm-hmm. than. Yeah. This, the kind of beauty and allure of finding things out from the past is actually these dead well, bits of animals. And, Loren, yeah. let me just say that what I discovered during my research for this talk is that birds shed their feathers every four months. <laughs> so you don't have to kill a bird to get a feather. <laughs> but if you kill a bird, then you, know, you, you can use not only the glorious plumage, like the tail feathers, which are usually the longest and the most exciting, you can also use the down to fill. The heads know. and the beaks and, yeah. But that it, we don't know basically whether early modern feather work would have required the deaths of the birds or whether they were collected, mm-hmm. the feathers were collected because you could collect them. Mm-hmm. And as I understand it, contemporary headdresses that are created for elders in Native American tribes don't kill a bird in order to get mm-hmm. the feathers. Never, never. So this is an interesting thing that we, th- yeah. we see death and maybe maybe it's there. I mean, this amount of feathers, it's a lot, but maybe... Well, yeah. and speaking of this kind of the, all those red ibis feathers, uh-huh. that there was such a demand for these cloaks mm, that well, this the, is thing. the local people were learning how to make fake red feathers Brilliant. by putting a kind of chemical on other birds who had just ordinary colors, and then it would grow out red. Yeah. So the commodity, so you know, that whole kind of a sense of demand <laughs> and supply, mm-hmm. that, that sort of notion of that exchange getting really to be so impactful. Yeah. Yeah. Can I can I ask one one other thing, which is something that we've we've spoken about before, which is about terminology and how how we talk about mm-hmm. objects. Um, and Steph, you I think you were there as well at the Indigenous Mobilities Conference, for example, that we were mm-hmm. at recently, um, where you know mm-hmm. is objects is things is that too much that mm-hmm. that idea of commodities that have come down to us from colonialism? I mean, is this do we need to think about if if we want to think differently about these kinds of relationships between people and landscapes and and animals and Mm -hmm. ecologies i mean do do we need a different vocabulary is 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 objects is things enough i mean there's so much in scholarly around the material term uh turn around using these words i mean what what do others think about this i i mean uh if I can answer, I, I think that we do need another relationship. I think that we, we, we need to go back to the use value idea, but also that reuse value and how mm-hmm. um, if you're going to have something, 
it, it does need to have this life and to, to have it kind of acknowledged. Like we just build a pond in our garden. We, we have to care for it. It's not just something as a decoration or a thing. It's a, it's a living body of water. I went and fed it with tobacco recently. It, I want to see what happens. I want to see the life that comes to that place and to care for it. And I think that's the way we might look at everything we have. Clothes, jewelry, I don't know, everything in our kitchen. You know, do we look after it? Do we make it last? Do we not just think about it as disposable and... Mm -hmm more of that kind of attitude i don't know about language that might be i mean i think that that is a really important mind shift i'm not sure how we linguistically enact it for me the 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 impulse that i have is to is to watch the inverse like the objectification so you take something and you watch the processes that are involved in creating that into something that can then be used as a way of hoping to to undo it um, rather than replicate it which we talk about a lot you know how do we speak about racist imagery without repeating the yeah. you know it's a yeah it's a complicated mm. thing but i think consciousness is the most important you know when you're going into it you you, you have to make your intentions heard in whatever way yeah and if you're a historian i mean you have to tell what happened mm -hmm. and i think that there may be too much censorship now or people feeling they can't speak about something I mean, I wanted to know everything that was written about indigenous people, good or bad, because I wanted to understand what what perceptions. And I mean, this whole feathered headdress thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, oh fo God. it's following me into my life in Exeter where I'm fighting the local rugby team. I'm not fighting them, but, you know, they come to me. <laughs> they come to me and, they, you know, they say, I'm trying to honor you. And I said, well, you know, I was on the radio re interviewed recently. And I said, well, you know, we had a concept of counting coup, which is you get close to your enemy, you touch them, and that's actually a really powerful thing to do is you take something from them, you take their power. Well, when you wear a headdress and you're not a native, you're counting coup on me. You're taking my, my integrity and my power and, and trying to get people to see it that way because they really just think it's so harmless. And it... It, because it is my dad's culture. I mean, he never got to wear a headdress. It, it's a very special thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so to see guys in the audience going, sure. Ooh, or what, oh, you know, do whatever they do. Because you know? it is the behavior, too, that that induces. You know, as soon as you kind of put it on, yeah. people start to change their behavior as a result yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it sort of is the Indian queen kind of persona yeah. you know like i want to be this really elegant mm -hmm. person mm -hmm. and i want to be powerful i'm going to mm -hmm. wear this but without any understanding of what it is mm -hmm. you know it's there was there's was so much controversy around glastonbury a few years ago banning the sale of the, mm. the feather headdresses and it wasn't even that people couldn't wear them it's just that they couldn't sell them within oh. within the festival i think and yeah. just the, the outrage on, on social media about not being able to wear plastic feathers <laughs> manufactured in China that's supposed to look like some kind of North American and yet using South American colors, schemes of birds. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just the, <laughs> not, just the layers of... Very confused. Yeah. Lack of or misinterpretation of, of everything was just really shocking. But I think part of it is just that lack of understanding of the that the historic connections that that Britain actually has with the Americas, um, that the that these colonized spaces aren't actually at a remove, that they very much go deep to the into the heart of so much of society and culture here in Britain. Mm -hmm. Truly. I, I suppose one of the most obvious ways is just the insanely high death rate in the colonies, which maybe is kind of um, a, a simpler answer than you're looking for, but even you know the fact that the occupation of these lands, often built on top of indigenous burial grounds, so even just the act of planting on land might be taking away indigenous um, access to their own ancestral homelands. So I suppose ev even just these plantations taking up the space that they do prevent <laughs> indigenous peoples from accessing very important elements of that land, whether or not it's growing, harvesting the food, the types of crops that they're able to grow themselves. Um, we were speaking before about the three sisters in yeah. previous conversations of, 
of corn, beans and squash. And, and if, if the land is just being used in this very, in that kind of European way of, of just using the land until it starts to, to die and stop yielding so many goods, um, that, that's kind of such a major hindrance in of itself. Um, yeah, and in New England, a lot of the animals, they imported like cows and pigs and sheep. They, they were just you know, devastating any kind of planting that Native people were trying to do. So, mm. yeah, I mean, it comes at all sides. And it was a, it was a huge influx of, of English people from in the 17th century on that coastline. So all across Indigenous America. I'm reminded also in, in um, a Spanish account of Brazil, where um, before the Spanish and the Portuguese started importing large numbers of Africans, and so the, largely the enslaved population were indigenous. Mm. And this there's this really memorable um, quotation from one of the accounts where an enslaved Tupi man um, is lamenting the fact that he can't wear feathers um, and, and yeah. he's no longer able to wear feathers because he's forced to work on these plantations. Hmm. And so that idea of just of, of him not ha he's on on these ancestral homelands and he can't live out the kind of identifications with his own culture, um, hmm. even as as he's occupying that that space. It must be really early. Wow. I'd it's like 1613. To... Yeah, that would be really interesting to have a look at. That. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Yep. Yeah. Really I think, and I think that in, I mean, I, I'm unfortunately kind of hampered by my inability to speak any of these indigenous languages, but the, there's a sense, I think, in which the, the Tupinamba word for nakedness is without feathers. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's recognizing the power of these things, which um, in, in European eyes look very fabulous but very, I think, very disposable. Mm -hmm. You know, even though this, this thing is, was in a collection and a cabinet, it does have that idea of death, you know, of being kind of, you know, we murder to dissect sort of thing. You know, it's, it, we wanted to understand it, but then once we got it, mm -hmm. lock it away. And, um, oh, that's really interesting, Lorraine, about that man. Because, I, I mean, I, it's like today, you know, my dad could not do the things that he wanted to do because he had to go to a boarding school in which they took away his language because it was so threatening for the United States to have people that didn't do what they wanted them to do. And that's just my, you know, it's my father. That's how recent it is. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, thank you. That was a good question. Thank you. Well, I think I'm really calling for a lot of these things to go back because a part of the, the death is the separation from their context. So, I mean, this I don't know about this particular cape, but I did watch some Blackfoot people be shown regalia that they hadn't seen for 200 years in Exeter Museum, and they were singing to that particular piece. And, and that performative aspect was suddenly real to me. Like this was in a dance, this was used in a ceremony. And this wasn't just a shirt, it wasn't just regalia, it was something that was dancing and yeah. So I, I think that partly it's the, the reconnection with their original, their originators as much as possible. And then, then a revivifying of perhaps the ceremony itself. I mean, there are some ceremonies that are coming back in, in certain indigenous populations. So, I mean, the Tupi, I don't know how they feel, but these cloaks have not gone back as far as they're all in Europe that I don't know any that are in Brazil. So, you know, this is like keeping them from their history and their, their knowledge. And they're so connected, as you say, with the the, object if we want to say that the yeah. cultural belonging of it yeah. is then so tied up to the songs to the oral histories yeah. the things that that europeans kind of obliterated when they only wrote things down in texts um yeah. so i suppose related to that idea of the performance is is opening up the possibilities of renewal with with language and oh absolutely yeah and, and song and music and all of that Definitely. I think that, that it can be reconstructed. And, you know, it is like all culture. It does change. It modulates. It, it revives. 
there were fragments of cultures left after the colonization, but those fragments can be remade into something new that is actually healing. And that, I think healing is the kind of central, I know it is in Robin Wall Kimmerer that, you know, we're, we're all kind of separated from this and, and we do need to kind of do this dance back into that relationship. So it's not just indigenous, but, you know, I think that first step is the repatriation, you know, and it is happening. I know it's happening in parts of England, in Germany, in the Quai Branly, you know, a lot of them are starting to give the, some of these pieces back that were taken illegally, a lot of it. Mm -hmm. You know, someone died and they just took everything or they, or they beat everybody up and, and took, it, took it all. And that's um, wrong. Yeah, that just, I, I was in, in Paris recently at the Quai Branly and it's amazing the way that France is just left out of the museum. You know, the museum is about, oh, look at these different indigenous cultures and these like <laughs> global kind of artifacts. <laughs> and just France is not in the story at all. Like it's just completely, there's just no mention. Of, yeah, they're magically here. Yeah, <laughs> they're magically here. Um, <laughs> And, and we, we won't mention the, the mantle in the Ashmolean, maybe. Oh, there, but, gosh, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. But the, I think this, I, I suppose that, that idea of the afterlife of objects can be a bit misleading because it does make, make it sound as if, you know, they, they continue to be able to remove until they're just kind of there and they're lost of, they're divested of any, any meaning. And so that idea of, of, of circularity or things being able to come back around seems mm -hmm. very important. Yeah, I, I think so. It's reconnecting the knowledges. I mean, think how much we could learn from this 2P piece if it went back to the people and they told us about the bird figure and the bird ceremony they were doing and the uses of tobacco. I mean, we'd learn a lot. We, well, we are starting to listen, definitely. And we're starting to let the people speak who need to speak. Really, I, it does make me think of um, a line in, in one of these tobacco poems or in one of the prefatory verses by a gentleman, we don't know who, um, and it says, take up these lines tobacco-like into thy brain and they're divinely touched, puff out the smoke again. Mm -hmm. And and it does seem there that, they're, that you're kind of inhale, you're mm -hmm. meant to kind of be inhaling tobacco <laughs> when this is happening. Mm -hmm. um, you get a sense of this like breath that they're taking and then letting out you know, these, these conversations and, and these modes of sociability as they go along. And so tobacco is that, yeah, it's, it's there, it's on the table um, and it's in their pockets and their servants have it. And it is, it is all around them. Um, it's something that came out quite nicely in um, an exhibition I've been working on at the Middle Temple Library uh, in London. And we worked with a contemporary globe maker and she's made these kind of miniature pocket globes um, for each of the cases. And one of the cases is on tobacco and she had these big tobacco leaves brought from Virginia mm. to make a base for the globe. And I love that idea of, of playing around with scale of it so that you have this globe sitting on this kind of oversized tobacco leaf because it gives you, a, it, it kind of, <laughs> rather than the sense of Europeans kind of going out and imposing themselves, it gives you the, the sense of that world kind of shrinking and, and being contained within this very potent kind of leaf that's come from somewhere else. And I think, yeah, that, that idea of, of playing with scale a bit and thinking about the way that the senses come into these performative elements is, is just as important as, as perhaps the, the words that are being uttered as the smoking happens. I don't know if you have anything to add about Well, that the is. only thing I was thinking is that just how overwhelming a sensory experience it must be <laughs> to come into contact with these colours and these textures and these smells and these, that it is, and like you say, what we have left are texts and memories of smoking from 20 years ago. <laughs> but you know, that sort of like, actually, how do we recover those? That This is another sense of the lost language is the body. The body is all we have left of these sort of two dimensional, and that maybe this is part of what we need to recover in order to to reclaim those relationships and is is the language of, of sensation as well. Because it is difficult to talk about those things. And it is a, it is character too, an essence and um, the, the sweet grass. We've been mentioning yeah. this woman, Robin Wall Kimmerer, and she's written a book called Braiding Sweetgrass. I don't know if some of you know about it, but Sweetgrass was to the Cheyenne the very first thing that was given to them as a people. 
and it's also very important in Dakota and Lakota culture, but it is a herb I didn't understand. It to me it was grass, you know, it was like it looks green and grows the same and but it is a special species and when it's picked at the right time and braided, it's used in ceremony. And if you smell sweetgrass, I was gonna bring it, I totally forgot. It just has an essence. And so that personality, when you breathe it in, it actually modifies you. Mm -hmm. And so I can say this from personal experience being in the Sundance, that it is a four-day ceremony without eating and drinking. Technically you can, you know, but you're not really supposed to. It sounds quite harsh, but in the middle of a hot summer day on the plains, they brought the sweet grass around at about the lowest point. We were all really tired and all of us ingested it through our nose, the sweet grass, and we were all just, our spirits just went zoom. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this plant is teaching me. And that's the relationship, you know, I am the learner. Mm -hmm. And so I really honor those, and we give them as gifts to each other, but it's, um, and you can get it here if, you, if you're interested, because I, I get a supply here, so. <laughs> Anyway. I, Lorraine and I had a very sort of small prosaic version of this when we went to the Oxford Botanic Gardens in high summer and they have a, a border which is planted with American plants and Lorraine stood there and went and she was I, I'm, I'm home you, know, this, that you don't even really notice it like what are these things that we associate with home the sound of a wood pigeon or you know that that Lorraine had this like wow this smells this smells like home, you know, and she was silent for like three minutes, smelling her home. Yeah. So you can go, it's just down the road. <laughs> Not now, maybe it won't smell so potent, but they're available to us, I guess is what I mean, these experiences, even even here, even us. Yeah, I think we, we all kind of felt that at the, the herbaria as yeah. well, that even in these plant specimens that are 400 years old, mm -hmm. Having, having their kind of crunchy, leafy cells kind of pasted onto these, this parchment that we associate with, with books and with manuscripts and having those together there. And the plants have th these properties and a, a sense of presence there on the, on the page. It was really marvelous. They were beautiful, truly beautiful. And what a treasure to have here in, in Oxford. It's wonderful. That's very good question. <laughs> we, had, we had a little bit of that again at the herbaria, didn't we, where some of the pages, I mean, most of them had these, you kind of see these early attempts at classification um, going on with the kind of Latin names or English names. And very, very occasionally underneath it would say like the Indian name is and then have that name. And then immediately when you have that name on the page, you think about the plant differently, differently. than yep. you did before mm -hmm. and it's just how limited is our view at the moment when we don't have mm -hmm. this information there um i know there are a lot of gardens that are trying to think about these ideas and in fact loren you and the lady from q had a conversation about this on the radio um talking about the ways in which you can reclassify and replant but most of the plants that are that are growing are not they're not the same plants that would like they would, you know, yeah. <laughs> so I know we, I also thought that I was like, can I find a tree that was brought over from? No, not even a tree. Um, but certainly a lot of the, the people who are curating gardens now are trying to think about ways in which they can correctly, which is difficult, think about the ways in which indigenous peoples might have thought about these plants or named them and, and what uses they had for them. And, you know, may still have for them. So, and I, I think it really does radically change the way that you experience a, a garden if you start thinking about those things. And and gardens, I do agree, are are a kind of colonial, in some yes. ways are very colonial sure. spaces, you know, and, and thinking about the rise of gardening in yeah. England happening mm -hmm. and with these kind of ordered par and, uh -huh. and and potting things and, mm -hmm. and that coming out of, of the colonial impulse in a lot of ways. So there is this kind of inextricable, yeah relationship mm -hmm. between these you know bet between gardens and, and colonial knowledge and our, our appreciation of plants and it's something we'll be discussing again on friday um <laughs> at the ashmolean museum in mm -hmm. our being human festival events there if anyone's interested we'll be trying to prize apart still life paintings and, and their connections to, to plants and empire but there's 
there's a lot of interest in, in this at, at the moment, but maybe not less of a clear sense of how actually to proceed. And I think it, individual cases and every, every kind of garden and institution is going to have yeah. to reckon with itself yeah. in, in its mm -hmm. own way. Yep. Um, hmm. Well, I mean, the, the traditional explanation is, is that Columbus, when he sailed into the waters to the west, wanted to reach India, but basically the Spice Islands, which would be like the Moluccas, which are in the Indian Ocean. But his globe was smaller, it was too small, he didn't reckon on how big the world was. So he saw in India as being easier to reach. But when he got to those islands in the Caribbean, he was thinking, I'm at the Spice Islands, therefore I'm at an, the outskirts of India. And so he maybe called them Indians. I've heard other, I know, but it's, it's sort of, think about this, 600 different, just in North America, peoples, you're all Indians. I mean, what does that do? That is the allegorical maneuver, isn't yeah. it? Of just let's make them all the same and we can treat them all the same. Mm -hmm. And it is the beginning of ra the idea of race. And race is an idea. It's not a real thing. I will assure you of that. <laughs> That's my point of view anyway. <laughs> Um, well, thank you. I thought um, I had this on my desk earlier today and it reminded me of just how brilliant Natalie Diaz's post-colonial love poem is. I don't know if anyone's read it. It, it won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry this year. Um, uh, the whole thing is brilliant, but I just wanted to end maybe with a few lines um, from one of her poems. Manhattan is a Lenape word. Even a watch must be wound. How can a century or a heart turn if nobody asks, where have all the natives gone? If you are where you are, then where are those who are not here? Is this the glittering world I've been begging for? And I think in some ways, a, a lot of those questions about mm -hmm. where, yeah. where are these voices? Where are these perspectives? How, how, can, we, how can we learn to see them in, in art, in, in literature um, across time and, and since since the colonial project um, has informed so much of, of what we're thinking and what we're moving towards and hopefully it is a reparative and restorative act that will bring a kind of glittering world for everyone mm -hmm. rather than just for some and um, so thank you very much everyone for coming thank you. Um,